good morning everyone and welcome to church this morning. We're now into around seven weeks of what seems to be our current normal and I hope all of you are coping okay. Robert Murdoch will be bringing God's word to us later on, continuing our series in 1 Timothy. So thanks Robert for sharing with us today. I started a study recently working through the book of Job and I think it's one of my favourite books in the Bible actually. And it's God really showing his power and his sovereignty over our suffering. Job was a man who seemed to have everything figured out. He had everything he could possibly ask for, but most importantly, he was blameless and upright before God. The one thing though that really stands out to me is Job's reaction to suffering. We all face challenges, some more difficult than others. I know there's some of us in our church family right now who are really, really hurting. And in these times, it's really difficult to see the reasons for our suffering, the reasons for our pain. But in Job, we hear his reaction. He says, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And that seems like such a hard thing to grasp. But in our times of need, we need to turn to our everlasting Father, who gives us an eternal hope in him. For our worship this morning, we're going to sing, Oh Praise the Name, a brilliant song of adoration of our Lord. And then it as well, really emphasising that message that we heard in Job, so join us and dwell in the words of these songs as we sing. Let's just pray before we begin. Father, we thank you that you are a good, good God. Lord, we know that in these times of uncertainty, we know that we can turn to you and that you are our hope and that you are our certainty. Father, we, we thank you that when we are hurting, when we are suffering, Lord, when we feel that there is no one else to turn to, we thank you that we can turn to you and we can sing, It is well with my soul. Lord, I pray that as we sing these words today, that they would be true in our hearts. And Lord, we pray that you would accept our worship as we sing of our adoration of you. We pray this in your name. Amen.
morning, boys and girls. I hope you're all doing really, really well. Um, last week we were thinking about how Jesus taught his disciples to, to pray, so he taught them the Lord's Prayer. So Linda covered the Lord's Prayer last week, um, and this week we're moving on to think a little bit more about how Jesus taught people. So thinking about something called a parable. So Jesus told these parables which is basically a story that people could understand. So Jesus told parables to the crowds that came to listen to him. And the one this week is about salvation. So what's salvation, you may ask? So salvation is about rescue. So how can we be saved or rescued? So Jesus came to rescue us from our sin, from the bad things that we do. So we know that Jesus came and he died on the cross. And when he did that, he paid the price for all the bad things that we do. So if we're not listening to mum and dad, if we're telling lies, lots of things like that. Those are called sin and Jesus paid the price for all those sins so that we could be rescued or we could be saved. And how do we do that? Well, all we have to do is say, Jesus, I am sorry for what I've done. Please forgive me and come into my heart, my life. Help me to live for you. Help me to be obedient and help me to do what you want me to do. And Jesus saves us uh, and we become a part of uh, God's family. So that's what salvation is. So he was teaching about salvation. So the parable that he, or what I think about this week comes from Mark chapter 4 verses 1 to 20. And it's about a farmer who went out into his field with some seeds and he was planting those seeds in the ground. So he was scattering them, he was just throwing them out onto the ground and then hoping that they would grow got me thinking about something that we did last year. So last year, who remembers getting some sunflower seeds from Linda? And we had a little sunflower competition. So here I've got a little sunflower seed. And what we did last year was we took those sunflower seeds and we put them into a little pot in the soil. And what else did we need? So we had to add, we had to add uh, water. We had to put them in a nice sunny place. We needed a few other things. We needed lots of time. So it just doesn't turn into a sunflower overnight. It takes lots of time. And for us, well for me, patience. Whew, that's not easy. Um, so being patient, waiting for that little seed to turn into a beautiful flower. And when it grows into a sunflower, then you get lots more of these little sunflower seeds. And you can use them again and make more sunflowers the following year. Uh, and that's what we've done. So this year we took some of the seeds that we got from last year's sunflower and we planted them a few weeks ago and they started to grow. And you can see this little picture here of the little uh, sprouts that have started to come from the sunflower seeds. So hopefully by August we'll have some nice sunflowers. It doesn't always uh, grow very easily so here we can see that during the week my little sunflowers that we planted were being eaten by a squirrel. And I had to chase him away, uh, otherwise we would have no sunflowers. So sometimes birds and squirrels will come and eat the seeds, so they don't always make it into a sunflower. So Jesus was teaching this parable about the farmer who went out and he scattered these seeds. Some landed on paths, uh, and because of that the birds came down, maybe the squirrels, and ate seeds. So those seeds didn't have a chance. Some seed landed on um, soil that wasn't deep. It was quite rough and dry and they maybe started to grow but then the sun was shining on them and they dried up and died. Some landed in among the weeds, grew maybe a little bit but then the weeds choked them. And then the soil, it was really good when this, uh, the seeds landed on the really good soil, it grew really well and those were the ones that turned into the, the the harvest. So a bit like the sunflower. We plant it in good soil and it turns into a lovely sunflower if we look after it. So the seed that we're talking about here, uh, or what Jesus was talking about, was actually God's word. So that's what he was trying to say. So God's word, when it falls on good ground, so if it falls into our heart and we listen to what God tells us, and we are obedient, and we pray, and we ask God to help us, and we read his Bible, the word of God and um, we listen to all the things that were taught in Sunday school that's God's word and that helps us to grow uh, as Christians and if we put our trust in him and ask us ask him to forgive us and say Jesus you are uh, Lord of my uh, life I'm going to live for you and then he saves us from our sins 
but sometimes we don't listen. Sometimes maybe other things, a bit like the weeds, are getting in the way, or we're just too busy. But like the maybe the birds or the squirrels coming away and stealing the seed. So it's important that we listen, like the good soil. And the good thing about it is, if we listen and we know God's word, we can tell other people about God's word, just a bit like this seed. So we can take the seed and give it to somebody else, and they too can become a Christian and learn about Jesus and ask him to forgive them. So that's what the story is about. So thinking about the seeds in God's word and how it grows in our hearts. Thank you for listening. Hello everyone. It's been great to see more of Hamilton Baptist online. I've been really appreciating the services and the devotions. Thanks for all of you who are contributing to that. I'm Hazel. I've been living in Japan in this time for about 12 years. We, my husband's a Japanese pastor and some of you will know Leo in Hamilton. Uh, we're all doing well. The state of emergency has been in place now for six weeks. Uh, it's not a strict lockdown like some of you have had to get used to. So we are free to go out um, as long as we limit our uh, social interaction and we try to avoid confined places. We're all doing well and we're so grateful for many things, including our garden, which we can uh, just spill out into instead of just being confined to the house. Uh, work is continuing as much as normal. Sakai is uh, with pastoring, obviously, and then as a handyman, he's out in the community a few days a week. He hasn't had to cur curtail that work at all. My English classes for kids have all gone online, so I'm really enjoying that now that I've got used to it. Unfortunately, I can't be in touch with the older people I teach, but uh, I do keep in touch with them by email and hope to meet them again soon. I'm kind of used to working from home, the three of us. Uh, we miss people from church, obviously. On Sundays, we have YouTube online and everybody's joining in as usual and people are contributing things to the service by sending in little videos or clips. And one of our latest projects was a song project. And I leave that with you now. It's called Make Us One Lord. Good morning. It's fantastic to welcome you to church if you're a regular at Hamilton Baptist. Welcome. And if you are brand new, the first time you've ever clicked on a church service, you're also very, very welcome. Thank you to our worship team and also to Stephen for leading us in our kids talk. And wasn't it great to hear from Hazel in Japan and also to hear some of our brothers and sisters raise their voices. What I'd like to do is just run you through a couple of th the things going on around the church this week. We'll pray together and then we'll hand over to Robert to bring God's word to us. 
If you would like to get in contact with us here at Hamilton Baptist, uh, our link is on our website. If you click get in touch, you'll see the email inquiry. If you want to fill that out, that'll get to where it needs to go to in the church. And on the other side there, you'll see details of the prayer chain and Robbie, our pastoral assistance details are with that as well. I've not mentioned this in a few weeks, but we've got weekly children's and youth discipleship packs that are being sent out. Today, they've been thinking about salvation and the road to salvation, as Stephen spoke about earlier. Uh, and if you don't currently receive a copy of this and you'd like to, just drop me a little email, jonathan.davy at hamiltonbaptist.org.uk or fill in the contact form on our website and we'll get that sent over to you. And also just a reminder of our Facebook devotions uh, from folks all throughout our church on Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays at 11 o'clock. We then put the three videos together and we put them on YouTube at the end of the week if you're not on Facebook. If you would like to, to bring a devotion, what we're asking is a scripture that is spoken to you during this time. So if you would like to do one, please, uh, something around five minutes, just let me know, get in contact and we'll make that happen. And finally, the last thing we would just want to bring your attention to is in this last couple of weeks we've been asking what more can we do to serve our community here in Hamilton. In the last couple of weeks I've been chatting to Isabel who's the food bank manager here in Hamilton uh, and their demand has been huge on just their services. They've got great people serving them on Tuesdays and Thursdays that are getting parcels delivered, they're currently not doing collections everything's delivery uh, and from now on for the foreseeable future during this period Hamilton Baptist are going to be running a Wednesday at the food bank. A massive thank you to our team who at short notice stepped up on Wednesday but if that's something that you would like to get involved with we'll only have four people on a week, two people who are helping to pack for the rest of the week and two delivery drivers. Obviously with our distancing measures at the minute, we can't do any more than that. So we just ask as well that you would pray for that work. It's a great opportunity for us to reach out more into our community. But please just be praying that as this work is, is being done, that something of the glory of Jesus would be known. So what I'd like to do, in fact, one more thing I want to point you to. Uh, I raised this on Wednesday if I can get that there, um, is a really helpful prayer resource during coronavirus from Christian Concern. The web link is on the bottom just there. But it's the prayer guide for coronavirus, a really comprehensive prayer guide packed with scripture. The link's also on our Facebook page. Please kick, click it, check it out, and use it. So why don't we come? We'll bow our heads before the word is preached. Let's pray. Father, we pray for the food banks throughout our nation, for those that are working so tirelessly, packaging and delivering more parcels than they've ever delivered before, but yet they have to do it with so few people because of the social distancing measures. Lord, we ask and pray your protection upon that work. We ask that they would have the resources that are needed. And we ask, Lord, that everything that everybody that needs would receive. Lord, we also lift before you all of those who in this time period have lost their jobs or are currently furloughed with their future uncertain. God, we ask that people's trust and their certainty would be in you. But Lord, we pray for just a real sense of peace in those situations. We ask for your comforting hand that although the future is unknown, you know the future and you walk with us into that future. So Lord, we do, we ask that your hand would be on all of those who feel their futures are uncertain at this time. And Lord, for our church family, we continue to pray for all of those who are struggling at this time. We pray for those who are vulnerable. Lord, we pray for those who have carers looking after them as well. God, would you just be with each and every person in our church family? Would they know that you love them unconditionally? Lord, and would we support one another? Would we pick up the phone? Would we encourage our brothers and sisters in Christ? Lord, we thank you for how much people have stepped up, how much neighbours are showing love to one another. And we ask that this would be a great opportunity for us as Christians to witness at this time. So God, go with us, we pray. Go with us as we hear the preaching of the word and go with us into the rest of this week. In your name we pray. Amen. We'll now hand over to Robbie, who's going to read Robert's passage from 1 Timothy chapter 1. Thank you. Good morning. 
It's good to have Robert Murdoch opening God's Word to us this morning. And he'll be preaching from a passage in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 to 20, which I'd like now to read in the New International Version. So if you have your Bibles, please open and turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1, starting at verse 12. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has given me strength that he considered me faithful, appointing me to his service. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honour and glory for ever and ever. Amen. Timothy, my son, I give you this instruction in keeping with the prophecies once made about you, so that by following them you might fight the good fight, holding on to faith and a good conscience. Some have rejected these and so have shipwrecked their faith. Among them are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan to be taught not to blaspheme. Amen. And may God bless the reading of his word. Thanks, Robert. It is nice to be with you um, today in Hamilton Baptist Church. Thank you for the kind invitation to be part of your services. I've been asked if I would speak on 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses uh, 12 through to verse the end of the chapter, which is verse 20. And uh, grateful that it's already been helpfully read for us. In this chapter then, Paul is writing to his young lieutenant, Timothy, and uh, really encouraging him uh, to stand up, stand up for Jesus like a good soldier of the cross or uh, to fight the good fight of faith um, or to fight the good fight of the gospel. Now, a little bit of the context. Uh, it seems that after Paul's imprisonment in Rome from around AD 60 to AD 62, that he was released for around five years, or it's difficult to know the exact details. And during that five-year period, he travelled at some point uh, in the eastern part of the empire um, with Titus and with Timothy. So he went, first of all, it seems, with the two of them to the island of Crete and built up the church that may have already been in existence there, but spent some time um, preaching and teaching and building this church up. Um, opposition arose in Crete and they felt it was right to leave, or at least Paul felt it was right to leave, so he left with Timothy and uh, in, as he left and uh, for Greece he decided that he would leave Titus uh, to continue the work that they had begun together. As they made their way towards Greece, Paul and Timothy, they stopped off in Ephesus and it was there that they encountered, within the ranks of the church, they encountered false teachers and false teaching. Two of these false teachers are actually uh, mentioned by name in this chapter, towards the end of the chapter, Hymenaeus and Alexander. And Paul has already taken action against them in, it would appear, excommunicating them from the church. Now, uh, Paul decided to continue his journey, but he left Timothy in charge of the church of Ephesus to steer it away from some of the problems that they were uh, experiencing. Uh, difficult to uh, be uh, precise about the nature of the false teaching that they uh, had encountered in Ephesus. Verse 4 seems to suggest that it involved a fascination with myths, genealogies, and divisive speculation. Uh, this 
group of teachers that Paul struggled with in Ephesus were focusing on the outer fringes of the Christian message and never really getting to the heart of it. Uh, sometimes we see that uh, in, in the college where I teach uh, um, and, and where I uh, spend most of my life working with students. We see them in sermon class and so they're assigned a passage of scripture and uh, what they do is they take maybe one word from the passage and they'll link it with something in the depths of the Old Testament or some other place in the Bible and they'll build a whole message on one word. Now, and that's not necessarily wrong but what it is to say is that the message of the passage that they were assigned is lost and the message of the original writer is completely lost in this message that they put together. And it seems that that was part of the difficulty that was uh, being uh, in encountered in the church at Ephesus. So Timothy is left there uh, to stop um, false teachers from misleading the church. He is to steer them back to the clarity of scripture and the centrality of the gospel and he is to ensure that the main thing remains the main thing. Now it seems there was also a, a bit of confusion surrounding the law and again I'm not sure exactly what uh, that looked like. It, it, it doesn't seem to be the same problem that we see in the book of Galatians. It seems rather that they were uh, focusing on or fascinated with obscure details of the law and they were speculating as to the significance of all of these things um, for Christians. But the point is that the law was not being made, not being used properly. It was not made for the righteous, the law. It was made for rebels and sinners and it was made to show them their sin. It was never given as a means to get into heaven or a ladder up which we could climb into heaven. Instead, it's like a mirror that shows us the filth on our faces that we need to wash off. But in itself, the law did not transform. It's the gospel that transforms and it's the gospel that was entrusted to the Apostle Paul. And uh, it's the centrality of the gospel that Paul wants Timothy to fight for in the Ephesian church. He doesn't want the Ephesian church to be derailed by those who are focused and fascinated with myths and endless and pointless speculation. He wants this church in Ephesus to ensure that the main thing remains the main thing. And uh, he wants Timothy to work hard at ensuring that the church at Ephesus remains a gospel-centered church. It's quite something, isn't it, that uh, this church in Ephesus, which had uh, an apostle as its founder and early pastor should within a generation find itself losing grip of the gospel and that Paul would have to leave one of his uh, excuse me young men with them to ensure that uh, they remained on track. What, one of the things that struck me I, I spent a number of years pastoring a church in Western Canada and one of the things that struck me when I came back in 2013 to Scotland was was the number of churches that are no long church buildings at least that are no longer functioning as church buildings. I remember walking along Union Street in Aberdeen and seeing a number of churches that had been turned into nightclubs and pubs here in Edinburgh where I live. There's a, a ton of churches that are no longer being used as places where people meet to, to worship. And, and you wonder, what happened? And why did all of that take place? And I don't have a definitive answer, but I think at least part of the answer is that many of these places lost their grip on the gospel because it's the gospel that brings and gives life. And when a church loses its grip on the gospel, then death is inevitable. So Paul wants Timothy to ensure that this church uh, remains true to the gospel. Now, four things I want to leave with you from this passage that uh, has been read for us. I want you, first of all, to think of the illustration that he gives, an illustration of the gospel then there is an affirmation of the gospel, then there's an exaltation in response to the gospel, and uh, then finally there is some exhortations 
concerning the gospel. So those are the three or the four things that I want to leave with you this morning. So first of all, an illustration of the gospel, really verses 12 through 16, which gives us a glimpse into the heart of the Apostle Paul as he recalls the goodness and mercy of the Lord to him. In verse 17, Uh, He just erupts really in doxology or in praise as he thinks about how good Jesus and uh, how good the Lord has been to him. Now, in terms of this illustration, he mentions several things. Well, he describes himself, first of all, as the Lord's servant or as someone appointed to service. And you get a a note of gratitude in what Paul says. He's just uh, overwhelmed by the privilege that he has been given to have been appointed to service. It's interesting that he describes it as service and not as leadership, although he clearly was a leader, a leader amongst the apostles and a leader within the churches. But he describes himself primarily as the Lord's servant. And I think that's significant. I sometimes recall to others the title of one of John Piper's books, Brothers, We are not professionals. We are instead the Lord's servants. And here Paul describes himself as the Lord's servant. He is a servant of the church and he is a servant of the gospel. Now, uh, there were undoubtedly people connected to the church in Ephesus who were more interested in their own agenda and in their own fame and who lost sight of what their position within the church Uh, actually meant. They weren't there to elevate themselves, they were there to elevate the Lord. So Paul describes himself as the Lord's servant. Then he talks a little bit about his past and uh, what set him up for this role as an apostolic church planter. Well, he tells us about his past and he says that he was a blasphemer, a persecutor, and he says that he was a violent man. I'm involved from time to time in interviewing students um, in, in for college or for a college course. And I don't think in all of the interviews that I've been involved in, I don't think any of them have ever begun by saying, well, I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a violent person. In my mind's eye, I can almost see the response of the interview panel if any of them were to commence like this. And I don't think anybody would be jumping up and down uh, if they were presented with a candidate like this for some kind of ministry position. But of course, Paul is not exaggerating and he's not overstating things. Uh, all All three of these things were absolutely true concerning him. In Acts 26 verses 9 to 11, when he is standing before King Agrippa in Caesarea, giving an account of himself and defending himself to King Agrippa, he says uh, of his former life, he says, many a time I went from one synagogue to another to have them, that's Christians, punished. And I tried to force them to blaspheme. I was so obsessed with persecuting them that I even hunted them down in foreign cities. Hunting down Christians was the passion of his life. And those who stoned Stephen laid their cloaks or their coats at his feet. It seems that he was uh, the one that presided over the whole proceedings in the stoning of Stephen. In Acts chapter 9 verse 1 it says that, that Saul of Tarsus was breathing out murderous threats. Threats and slaughter had become his breath. He was like a war horse, breathing in the smell of battle. He thrived on the gore and the slaughter of the saints. And Jerusalem had become too small for his campaign. And so he hunted Christians wherever he could uh, in cities all around. That was his past. He was a bully boy and he ravaged the church. We all have a past, don't we? I have a past, you have a past. And maybe you think as you listen to me that your past means that you could never become a Christian. You're not like the nice people that attend church. Well, let me blow my cover and let me blow their cover. All of us are ugly sinners and all of us have a past. 
And if Paul could experience the grace of God, there's no reason why you couldn't experience the grace of God. For I doubt, because I doubt if you could match his record in terms of his past. So how then did he become appointed to the Lord's service? Well, he says in verse 13, I was shown mercy. Mercy is God's help for the helpless. And then in verse 14, he says that the grace of the Lord was poured over me abundantly. And we know the story from Acts chapter 9. From Acts chapter 9, he was helplessly blind until God opened his eyes and stopped him in his murderous tracks. And and, uh, God's forgiving and and cleansing grace washed over the evil of his past and he became a new creature in Christ. He says that grace had washed over him in abundance. The word abundance is actually seems like a made-up word, a word that Paul has made up. He's used uh, a, a prefix which is uh, tries in, in which intensifies uh, the word abundance, and it, it carries a sense of super abundance. And the picture that he is painting is is of a, a river that bursts its banks, and and that's what he says about the grace of God. God's grace burst its banks and washed over me. It just swamped me. And then he says in verse 13, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. Now in saying that, I acted in ignorance. I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. In saying that, he, he's not saying He's not trying to absolve himself or, or lessen his guilt. He's just stating the fact that he, in his past life, thought that Christians were misguided heretics who threatened the well-being of his beloved Judaism, and he felt it was the right thing to oppose them with every fiber of his being. He did it because he was blinded in sin and unbelief. Now, I'm not sure why he takes time to mention his ignorance as he talks about his past, Uh, It it might have to do with a distinction that is made in the Old Testament uh, between deliberately sinning and sinning unwittingly. Numbers 15 talks about offering sacrifices for unintentional sins. You see, it's possible to sin in an arrogant and high-handed way. But Paul wants us to see that he did not sin against the full light of the gospel. He was blind and ignorant to the truth concerning Jesus. He may even have been contrasting himself with uh, individuals that he mentions at the end of the chapter, Hymenaeus and Alexander, who sinned deliberately. Now, Paul's not saying that he's not blameworthy. He's just saying that his sin is not unforgivable. When Jesus prayed on the cross, Father, forgive them, his enemies, because they don't know what they are doing, then the conversion of Paul may be a direct answer to that prayer. In his heart, Paul knew that he had behaved like a violent man, but he had received mercy and grace, and it had washed over him like a torrent or like a flood. And now he says, He is possessed of faith. He's clinging to this Christ that he persecuted, clinging to him with with all that he has, trusting in him, believing that this Jesus was the Messiah. He's filled with faith concerning Christ and he's filled with love, love for Christ and love for the church. It's been a complete transformation. Some people think that, you know, You need to have a certain kind of disposition before you you can become a Christian. Uh, Some people imagine, you know, Christianity would never work for me. But the Bible is full of examples and illustrations of people who were the least in the least likely uh, to follow Jesus, the least bit likely to follow Jesus. You've got the woman at the well who had had five husbands and was now living with someone. Uh, You've got Zacchaeus who spent his life ripping people off. Jesus went home with him and transformed his life. You've got a man who lived in a graveyard, spent his life cutting himself, self-harming. Yet somehow Jesus broke into his life and transformed him. And history is full of similar examples. People who were transformed by the grace of God. 
And none of those stories is more powerful than the story of Saul of Tarsus. And it's here to remind us that if he can be transformed by the abundant grace of God, then so can you and so can I. Now, secondly, there is an affirmation. He says in verse 50, 15, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. It's the first of five trustworthy sayings in the pastoral epistles. They are sayings which are absolutely dependable. Sometimes you hear people say things and you think, ah, I'm not sure about that. I need time to think about that. But this is not one of those uh, sayings uh, and one of those things. This is a statement which is absolutely dependable. Absolutely dependable. And what Paul is saying is that the chief purpose of Christ in coming into this world was to save sinners. That's a staggering statement for a Pharisee to make because the Pharisees would never have believed that the coming Messiah would be interested in sinners. In their minds, the Messiah would have been mixing with people like them, not sinners. But here Paul says that the chief mission of Jesus in coming into the world was to save sinners. And he tells us that he believes that he is the worst sinner of all. Now, we think about that statement, I am the worst or I am the first or foremost sinner. And we think, well, isn't that a bit of an overstatement? What about Hitler? And what about King Herod? who put to death all of the little boys around um, Jerusalem, or around Bethlehem, rather. Wasn't he a worse sinner than Paul? Well, this isn't an overstatement. Paul means this. This is how he feels in his heart. He feels in his heart as though he is the worst of sinners. When your conscience has been awakened by the Holy Spirit, you'll have a deep sense of your own unworthiness, a sense of your own sinfulness and, and, a, and a sense of your own need of grace. The closer that you get to God, the more you will sense your own unworthiness. The, 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 the closer you get to the light, the more uh, of your uncleanness that you'll feel. Now, this is not some sort of morbid introspection. This is a healthy thing because this keeps us depending on grace. And it reminds us that we are right with God, not because of us, but we're right with God and in a right relationship with God based on his character and grounded in what Christ accomplished at the cross. And those are things that will never change. And that's a glorious fact. It means that God's love for me never changes from day to day. God will never love me more than he loves me now. And all of that's based in his character and in the work of Christ on, on the cross. By grace I am redeemed, and by grace I am restored. And as the hymn writer says, and now I freely walk in to the arms of Christ my Lord. In verse 16, Paul tells us why he was converted. I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus, might display his immense patience and as an example for those who would believe in him. It was not that God said, oh, well, Here's Paul, he's a religious person, he's not too bad, so let's begin with him and see how all of this works out. Neither was it a case that God said, you know, we need somebody bright, we need a bright boy to write half the, the New Testament, and Paul's a bright boy, let's begin with him. No, Paul says that, that, that God began with him a violent blasphemer and persecutor of the church, uh, as a testimony to what his grace could do. And so whenever someone says, you know, I'm, I'm too bad, you're never too bad to experience the grace of God. If God can, can transform the Apostle Paul, then God can transform you. I remember meeting a girl, I uh, came to my office one day and she said to me, I think God hates me and uh, stuff that she'd done, which I'll not go into. She says, I, I think God hates me, and I, I don't think there's any hope for me. 
and, and it, it was a joy to tell her a little bit about the Apostle Paul. And if there's hope for him, there's hope for you, no matter what you've done. You too can experience the transforming grace of God. Well, two quick things to finish with then. There's an exaltation now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God. Be honour and glory forever and ever. Amen. So Paul just bursts into doxology or exaltation. He describes God as eternal. God has no beginning and has no end. He describes God as immortal. God is imperishable, incorruptible. He will never experience death or decay. He says that God is invisible. God lives beyond the limits of every horizon. No one has ever seen him. All we have been given is glimpses of his glory. And he is described as the only God. A little girl was asked on one occasion, how many gods are there? And she responded to her Sunday school teacher and said, there's only one God. And the Sunday school teacher said, why is there only one God? And she says, because there's only room for one God. And it was a brilliant answer. There's only room for one God like this. And Paul bursts in praise for this God, for all that he's received from this God. And when you read through Paul's letters, if you had a highlighter and just highlight the number of times that he just bursts into praise, it's quite quite remarkable, quite, quite remarkable. There is an orthodoxy that is faithful, absolutely faithful, but it's cold and it's bereft of any sense of emotion. There's no irrepressible, spontaneous uh, eruption of praise emerging from, from their hearts. It's cold and it's dry and it doesn't have the kind of passion that we see here in Paul. What we see here in Paul is what we see in the story of John Newton. Remember him? Drunken slave trader, sailing the seven seas, plying his trade as, as a dealer in human flesh. And uh, the crew of his ship hated him and left him in Western Africa on one occasion. Such was their dislike for him. But sitting one day in, in the mast of a ship, God broke into his life and transformed him. And of course, he, he fought then for the abolition of slavery and so on. But he wrote a song about his experience of God's grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. That's the kind of thing that we see in Paul here. We're still singing John Newton's song as we sing, My chains are gone, I've been set free uh, uh, by, by the Lord. There is a sense of overwhelming gratitude here, which I feel absent in my life far too often. And I don't think I'm the only one. Sometimes I look down at congregations as I lead them in worship and you'd think that all of them had been to the dentist and just had their teeth extracted such as the somber faces that they have. But hasn't God been amazingly good to us? Haven't we so much to praise him for? When was the last time we were lost in wonder, love and praise, as, uh, as, as Charles Wesley wrote? C.S. Lewis wrote a book, Surprised by Joy. I, I would love to write a book, Overwhelmed by Grace. Overwhelmed by God's grace to me. Well, that's pray, uh, Paul, he, he praises. And finally, there's an exhortation. Uh, the exhortation has two parts to it. Uh, he, he is, first of all, there's a command. He is to fight the good fight. Timothy is to remember, he is to remember his commissioning when uh, hands were laid upon him and he was set apart for the work of uh, mission in his home church in Lystra. And he's to remember the things that people said about him uh, as they were prompted by the Holy Spirit to do so in the context of the first century. And he's to remember those things and he's to remain faithful. He's to fight the good fight. He is to fight for the gospel. He is to stand up for this gospel because the law cannot transform. Speculation and myths cannot transform people's lives. It's the gospel that's been entrusted to them and it's the gospel that they must proclaim. And it's the gospel and the clarity of scripture and its message that Timothy is to stand up for 
in Ephesus. And that's what Paul asks him to do, to fight a good warfare, to stand up and be counted for the gospel. I was interested to read in Kent Hughes's commentary of Hugh Latimer, who was one of the most uh, famous, I think, um, English reformers. And he was summoned uh, to preach before King Henry. Actually, he was a royal chaplain, so he preached frequently before King Henry VIII. And on one occasion, he offended the king. And uh, the king summoned him back the following week to apologize and to preach another sermon. And Hugh Latimer came back the next week and preached exactly the same sermon he had preached the week before. That's the kind of boldness and courage and clarity that Paul wants Timothy to have. But it's also the kind of boldness and clarity that God wants us to have. As we, as we live our lives with our family, as we live our lives with our colleagues at work, as we stand at the lockers at school, Paul wants us to stand up clearly for the gospel. And the last thing is just there's a concern as he gives him this exhortation. There's a concern. He wants him to do it full of faith. He, he doesn't want Timothy to abandon the faith. He wants Timothy to hold on to Christ and to entrust himself to Christ in the midst of this chaos. And also he wants him to do it with a good conscience. A good conscience. He wants Timothy to keep his conscience clean and clear. If there are things that he's been involved in, he wants him to go back and claim afresh the cleansing, purifying uh, effects of the blood of Christ. He is to stay away from anything he knows his conscience wouldn't uh, be at ease with. So he's to conduct himself, carry out his ministry with a clear conscience. I don't know if T Timothy was maybe tempted to harbour unforgiveness as he fought for the gospel in this church and became the object of the hostility of these false teachers and as they treated him badly. I don't know what he was tempted to do, but Paul wants him to conduct his ministry with a clear conscience. And so it is for us. We must ensure that we don't go against our conscience um, we must keep our conscience clean and we must make sure that we keep short accounts with the Lord and we must make sure that we keep our uh, spirits sweet and that we don't harbour things like unforgiveness if that's the thing that Timothy was tempted to do. So that's uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1 verses 12 through 20. Timothy is to keep the main thing the main thing. And he used to steer the church away from pointless speculations and myths. And he is to ensure that he gives voice to the gospel and he fights for the gospel and, and that he lifts up the gospel because that's the only thing that transforms. You know, over the course of my life and ministry, I've seen the gospel at work in so many different lives. I, I wish I had an opportunity to to, to share some of them uh, with you. Yeah. One lady in our church in Canada uh, was met by someone uh, who was filling in a census, the Canadian census for the government. And, and the lady saw that she was sick and said to her, I'd like some of our people to come and cut your grass for you. Would that be okay? And so our associate pastor went down and cut her grass every day, uh, all, or not every day, but every week, all summer. And at the end of the summer, she never spoke to him. At the end of the summer, this lady came out. She has been going through chemotherapy and she gave him a drink of water. That was the first conversation he had with her. And she said to him, why do you want to help me? And he said to her, because God has helped me. And if you give me an opportunity, I'd like to open the scriptures and show you how God has helped me. And, and he nearly fell off her veranda when she agreed. And he, he went down every week and he read the Gospel of Mark with her. And she gave her life to Christ and was transformed with it. And that story could be told a thousand times over. The Gospel transforms and I hope that you'll keep a grip of the Gospel. Thank you so much for your kind attention this morning.
Yeah.